Mark, chapter 13, beginning at verse 24. But in those days, following that distress, the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light. The stars will fall from the sky and the heavenly bodies will be shaken. At that time, people will see the Son of Man coming in clouds with great power and glory. And He will send His angels and gather His elect from the four winds, from the ends of the earth to the ends of the heavens. Now learn this lesson from the fig tree. As soon as its twigs get tender and its leaves come out, you know that summer is near. Even so, when you see these things happening, you know that it is near, right at the door. Truly, I tell you, this generation will certainly not pass away until all these things have happened. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will never pass away. But about that day or hour, no one knows. Not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. Be on guard. Be alert. You do not know when that time will come. It's like a man going away. He leaves his house and puts his servants in charge, each with their assigned task, and tells the one at the door to keep watch. Therefore, keep watch, because you do not know when the owner of the house will come back, whether in the evening or at midnight or when the rooster crows or at dawn. If he comes suddenly, do not let him find you sleeping. What I say to you, I say to everyone, watch. Would you bow your hearts with me for just a moment, please? Blessed Father, in these next few moments, I ask that you take these humble, halting words of mine and infuse them with your meaning that you would teach your people the message you would have them to hear, and that you would, above all things, Father, glorify your name. In Christ's name, amen. What is this passage about? When I was preparing this, I... I read through it and I said, well, that can't be right. This is eschatology. This is end times and we're, this is the first day of Advent. This is the first Sunday of Advent and we're talking about the sun being darkened and the moon will not give its light and, and don't be caught off guard. And I had to go and ask somebody, why on earth is the lectionary text the Olivet Discourse on the first Sunday of Advent. Aren't we looking forward to the coming of the Christ child? And I was told by some very friendly people that we are also looking forward to the second coming of the Christ child. And that put the whole thing in a new perspective. See, in the Hebrew mind, in, in, in the mind... (laughs) Of the Jews, prophecy is not an event and then a fulfillment. It does, it's not the prophet saying the Reds are going to win the World Series in 1991 and then the Reds win the World Series in 1991 and it's over. Prophecy is the event, the giving of the prophecy and its fulfillment and its fulfillment and its fulfillment. Prophecy is a pattern. This thing happened in as a... The prophet prophesies, the prophecy is fulfilled, and it is fulfilled again later, and it is fulfilled again later. So when Isaiah says, unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given... That was fulfilled, of course, in Bethlehem. It will be fulfilled again at his second coming. And this, this is the essence 
of hope. When we hope for something, we expect that thing to happen. We look forward to a time when that thing occurs. The uh, Bible dictionary says in Scripture, a hope is a confident expectation for the future. Describing both the act of hoping and the object hoped for. When grounded in God, hope provides the motivation to live the Christian life, even in the face of troubles. That's, that's pretty big. The motivation to live the Christian life, even in the face of troubles. Job, in one of my very favorite verses in the entire Bible... Chapter 13, verse 15 says, Even though he should slay me, yet will I hope in him. Yet will I argue my ways to his face. Psalm, chapter 33, beginning at verse 17. The war horse is a false hope for salvation. And by its great might it cannot rescue. Behold, the eye of the Lord is on those who fear Him, on those who hope in His steadfast love, that He may deliver their soul from death and keep them alive in famine. Our soul waits for the Lord. He is our help and our shield. For our heart is glad in Him, because we trust in His holy name, let your steadfast love, O Lord, be upon us, even as we hope in you. Proverbs chapter 13, verse 12, Hope deferred makes the heart sick, but a desire fulfilled is a tree of life. And then, of course, everyone's favorite verse on hope Isaiah chapter 40, verse 31. But those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength. They will soar on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not be faint. One more. Romans chapter 15, verse 13. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing. So that by the power of the Holy Spirit, you may abound in hope. It's tough to hope. It's, it's kind of easy sometimes when we're standing in a church, when we're sitting in the church and we're surrounded by like-minded believers and, and we've got these, these, these beautiful decorations and this wonderful, warm place where we have so many happy memories and lighting a candle always helps. It's easy to hope in a situation like that. It's easy to expect good things to happen. But let's not forget the times when we are alone in our living room flipping through channels on a television that we're not really watching. And we're thinking about what has gone before, about what is now, and about what will come. And sometimes, the more we think about these things, the darker and colder the room gets. It's hard to have hope in situations like that. Someone has said that if you could convince a man there was no hope, he would curse the day he was born. Hope is an indispensable quality of life. Years ago, the S-4 submarine was rammed by another ship and quickly sank. The entire crew was trapped in its prison house of death. Ships rushed to the scene of the disaster off the coast of Massachusetts. 
We don't know what took place down in the sunken submarine, but we can be sure that the men clung bravely to life as the oxygen slowly gave out. A diver placed his helmeted ear to the side of the vessel and listened. He heard a tapping noise. Someone, he learned, was tapping out a question in dots and dashes of the Morse code. The question came slowly. Is there any hope? In 1994, Chuck Colson, a founder, founder, former member of Richard Nixon's cabinet, who was indicted and sent to prison on charges related to his involvement in the infamous Watergate scandal, and who, while in prison, came to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ, was famously quoted as saying, Where is the hope? I meet millions of people who feel demoralized by the decay around us. The hope that each of us has is not in who governs us or what great laws we pass or what great things we do as a nation. Our hope is in the power of God working through the hearts of people. And that's where our hope is in this country. And that's where our hope is in life. Christianity Today writes, In 1982... Vice President George Bush represented the U.S. at the funeral of former Soviet leader Leonid Brezhnev. Bush was deeply moved by a silent protest carried out by Brezhnev's widow. She stood motionless by the coffin until seconds before it was closed. Then, just as the soldiers touched the lid... Brezhnev's wife performed an act of great courage and hope, a gesture that must surely rank as one of the most profound acts of civil disobedience ever committed. She reached down and made the sign of the cross on her husband's chest. There, in the citadel of secular atheistic power, the wife of the man who had run it all hoped that her husband was wrong. She hoped that there was another life and that that life was best represented by Jesus who died on the cross and that this same Jesus might yet have mercy on her husband. What do we hope for? We hope That we are not alone. Even in the dark hours when we sit in our living rooms and flip through the channels of a television we're not actually watching. Even when we lie in our beds at night and listen to the wind howl. We hope that we are not alone. In fact, we as Christians have a hope that burns more brightly than any other. We have a hope not only in the first coming of our Messiah, but in His second coming as well. We know He came. We know He will come again. In 1926, Dr. James Allen Francis penned these most profound words. He was born in an obscure village, the child of a peasant woman. He grew up in another obscure village where he worked in a carpenter shop until he was 30 when public opinion turned against him. He never wrote a book. He never held an office. He never went to college. He never visited A big city, he never traveled more than 200 miles from the place where he was born. He did none of these things, usually associated with greatness. He had no credentials but himself. He was only 33. 
His friends ran away. One of them denied him, and he was turned over to his enemies. He went through the mockery of a trial. He was nailed to a cross between two thieves. While dying, his executioners gambled for his clothing, the only property he had on earth. When he was dead, he was laid in a borrowed grave through the pity of a friend. Nineteen centuries have come and gone since that day. And today, Jesus is the central figure of the human race and the leader of mankind's progress. All the armies that have ever marched, all the navies that have ever sailed, all the parliaments that have ever sat, and all the kings that have ever reigned, put together, have not affected the life of mankind on earth as powerfully as this one solitary life. There's our hope. Not in some teaching of someone who came and stood and died and was buried and stayed dead. Not in some great philosophy taught in palaces in Europe or in caves in the Middle East. Not in some great wisdom passed down by ancient masters, but in a living man. In a living man who came into nothingness, who brought with him all that he would ever be, and who lives today. Our hope is in Him. And He's coming back. This is what Advent is about. This is what this holy season is for. Is for us to remember this one solitary life. I said before, The idea of prophecy to the Hebrew mind is a pattern. And I gave two examples that he came in the manger in Bethlehem, that he will come again someday. But those are two points on the line. He comes to each one of us individually. In the stillness of our own hearts. As we make ourselves available to him. He also makes himself available to us. We do not hope in a dead man. We do not hope in a man who cannot see. A man who cannot hear. We hope in a living, breathing God. Who loves us. That's our hope. That's our focus. That is Advent. Amen.